Good evening. Uh, I'm Gavin Cleesby, the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society, and I'm happy to welcome you this evening to our program. Uh, the Massachusetts Historical Society is uh, the first historical society in America. Uh, we are an independent nonprofit organization, and we date uh, all the way back to 1791. Uh, we maintain a research library with an amazing collection of material. It includes about 14 million manuscript pages, uh, including the papers of three of the first six U.S. presidents, uh, namely John Adams, John Quincy Adams, and the personal papers of Thomas Jefferson. For the past 230 years, we have made our collections available to researchers for free, uh, which we continue to do to this day. Uh, we also host a wide variety of programs, uh, and this fall we have some great things planned. Uh, we're only able to host these programs thanks to the support of our members and donors, and we hope that if you enjoy this program, you'll consider becoming a member or supporting our work. This evening, we'll hear from Professor Sam, Samuel Redman. Uh, he is the author of Bone Rooms, uh, From Scientific Racism to Human Prehistory in Museums, which he spoke about uh, at MHS back in July of 2016, uh, way before the pandemic. <laughs> uh, he is a specialist in American uh, cultural and museum history. He is an associate professor of history at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, uh, and has worked uh, at the Science Museum of Minnesota, as well as the Field Museum of Chicago, which I used to live very close to at one time. Uh, he will discuss his new book, Prophets and Ghosts, the story of salvage anthropology. Uh, this work looks at the um, actions of late 19th century anthropologists, linguists, and archeologists who began amassing indigenous cultural objects, craft, clothing, songs, and recordings by the millions. Uh, convinced that indigenous people were doomed to disappear, collectors donated these objects to museums uh, and universities that would preserve and exhibit them. Uh, Professor Redman will help us understand what we can learn from the complex legacy of salvage anthropology. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming him. Wow, um, it is so, so wonderful to be back here um, in Boston at the Massachusetts Historical Society. And um, this is just a really remarkable, special place uh, with incredible, amazing things for, for historians like myself to come uh, look at and enjoy and, and learn from and pass on to our students and, and um, encourage others to embrace and, and look at. So I feel really fortunate to be back here today to tell you about Prophets and Ghosts, the story of salvage anthropology, uh, my, my uh, new book. So this is sort of part of a trajectory so far of uh, three projects that uh, I have worked on all related to the history of museums. Um, predominantly on the history of anthropology, I uh, come at this from the background of being a uh, a student of anthropology and then someone who worked in museums who then as I was working in museums I became really curious about how all of these objects got to Chicago or how they got to uh, different uh, institutions where I, I, I became connected with so uh, I really became interested in, and fascinated with the story of the history of museums so um, that hopefully explains a little bit of our trajectory uh, today. So I'd like to begin with this uh, incredibly interesting image, uh, this really famous image. Uh, there are several similar images of the same uh, uh, setup. Francis Densmore, uh, pictured on the left with uh, Mountain Chief, a leader of the Blackfeet Nation. And uh, uh, to me, what's, uh, there's so many things that are remarkable about this photograph. The use of new technology, this phonograph machine and the wax cylinder intended to document the singing that uh, Mountain Chief is uh, uh, expressing. Uh, I also am fascinated by the, the sort of the contrast here, the way that uh, uh, Francis Stensmore is dressed uh, as compared to, to Mountain Chief and um, uh, I, I believe, based on uh, sort of the, the bricks in the background here, that this is just outside of the Smithsonian Institution. So we'll get back to Frances Densmore's story. Uh, uh, the book, uh, Prophets and Ghosts, begins with her getting on a train, uh, intending to go to St. Louis, where she wants to record the songs of Geronimo, honestly, one of the most famous men uh, in America at that time. 
Densmore becomes almost the quintessential salvage, salvage anthropologist. She records hundreds of songs and stories over the course of her career. She travels all across North America in a time when it would have been pretty remarkable and rare for a woman to do so. Um, and she scrounges together funding, uh, support from her family in Red Wing, Minnesota, but also um, support here and there from the Bureau of American Ethnology, a government organization that we'll get into later. Um, but in some ways, she becomes the quintessential salvage anthropologist because, as we'll see, she's obsessed with this idea that there's something that needs to be salvaged or rescued here in the story of culture in North America. So really our story today will begin here with another, uh, to me, truly remarkable image of people lined up uh, uh, sort of in their Sunday finery. I don't think that this picture was necessarily taken on a Sunday, but, uh, but people certainly dressed to the nines here, um, lining up uh, to uh, enjoy the new Field Museum of Natural History that's just been opened in Chicago uh, in 1921, uh, a little uh, ways away from where the original building was, uh, completed, but uh, here people are, are standing in line to enjoy this, this magnificent new sculpture, almost a monument to natural history. And one could sort of ask, uh, looking back at this picture in, in retrospect, what is motivating these people to do this? Why are they here? What are they going to look at when they go into the museum? And sort of just continuing on with this example, here's this remarkable and grand architecture of Stanley Field Hall, the central entryway to the Field Museum, where one would have encountered remarkable things from the natural world, geology, paleontology, uh, 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 ecology, uh, but also, of course, uh, would have encountered uh, anthropology or the study of man in this space. And here we are flashing forward a few years later to the middle of the 20th century. And you can look at photographs like this and see that people would have uh, encountered uh, uh, remarkable things from around the world at an institution like this. They might have seen a meteorite for the first time, or they might have seen dinosaur fossils, but they, of course, also very likely would have seen Native American objects or material culture uh, as pictured here. You can also read about these things in newspapers, or if you've read J.D. Salinger's Catcher in the Rye, there's a famous scene where the protagonist ducks into the Natural History Museum. He's looking for his sister and he's remembering back to field trips where he's gone to the Natural History Museum and learned about Native Americans for the first time. So, of course, this is something that was really consequentially important throughout the 20th century. You could ask a parent or a grandparent or a great grandparent about visiting a natural history museum and what that would have been like before uh, really the expansion of documentary film or uh, cable television or even color photographs in magazines or newspapers. And this would have been a, a remarkable way to learn about the natural world uh, from a variety of different uh, ways. And this isn't just something that is like of the past, right? This is something that still exists today. Um, there, of, of course, have been changes and, and there's always a contradiction with thinking about museum history. Here it is in this building that is in some ways unchanged since the 1920s or even since the 19th century. And it even harkens back to Greek and Roman sort of styles of architecture. So. The continuity here is something that they're trying to emphasize, but of course there's a great deal of change that's happening here right new dinosaurs new plants new um, uh, parties and, and public events that we can clearly see that are, are happening here. Um, uh, continuity and change are both uh, happening in this space and perhaps as another indicator of that the field museum the space that we're sort of looking at uh, has recently opened up a new uh, native north american hall called native truths our voices our stories that takes quite a different tact than the perspectives that i'm really talking about uh, today but i just want to indicate to you that this is a story we're talking about today that has a history a history that's resonant and a history that is still uh you know really something that is um, uh, important to thinking about uh, today and um, 
understanding museums today. So uh, I want to sort of, in some ways, begin at the end here. I did a whole host of um, uh, research projects to understand this from the 19th and early 20th century perspective. But then ultimately, by the end, I started doing some interviews with uh, Native artists and Native curators. And frankly, Marie Watt, who is this incredible uh, artist, scholar, uh, a colleague, a, a friend, um, uh, an incredible mentor to other artists and 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 at some point we were talking about um, this as a as a concept and and how people understand native culture and and she said to me something that I thought put uh, you know she really put her finger on this as a as a problem when she said to me it's problematic that most people's understanding of American indigenous culture is often limited to objects in museums and anthropology collections darkly lit under glass rather than direct experience interaction and engagement with indigenous people and in our community so if you look back at those photographs from the middle of the 20th century you can sort of see what uh, marie is is talking about and making reference to here this idea that so many people when they first learned about native people it's sort of this almost under glass and static and, and almost as though they're trapped in amber uh, and outside of the bounds of historical change in a way that can ultimately be really problematic and, and harmful for Native people today. So why is this the case? Why is this problem the way that it is? And I want to argue uh, that to you today uh, and in, in the book, Prophets and Ghosts, that a large part of the answer has to do with this phenomenon called salvage anthropology. And as part and parcel of this project, I want to take the idea of salvage anthropology seriously. Uh, there are uh, some of my colleagues who uh, so far have, have uh, pushed back on certain aspects of this uh, book, but also um, uh, uh, issued a, a public letter uh, a couple of years ago, uh, uh, stating that uh, salvage anthropology, amongst other things, was a buzzword used to criticize anthropology today. So merely a buzzword. We're, we're sort of looking back at anthropology and retrospectively uh, engaging in historical revisionism. And I want to argue to you to, today that that's not actually the case, that this was a real phenomenon that happened and that we can understand it and, and think about it in important ways. Uh, and and it in fact, influences this problem that Marie Watt is talking about in that quote. But what even is salvage anthropology? When I'm sitting next to someone on an airplane uh, and they, they, they were, would ask me, what are you writing about? I would say, I'm writing about salvage anthropology. Invariably, this was the question, right? What even is salvage anthropology? All right, so now I'm going to break two of the cardinal rules of public speaking. Please never do this. You're never supposed to show a wall of text to people and you're never supposed to just read to people off of a slide. But here we are. Sorry, um, but in order to sort of get us all on the same page, I think it might be useful to just sort of see a definition of what people think and say salvage anthropology even is, or in this case, salvage ethnography, uh, this related idea of documenting human culture. So a specialist dictionary in this case, but the Dictionary of Social Sciences defines salvage ethnography as, quote, generally associated with the anthropology of Franz Boas. So you can see this one person and his students among the American Indians around the turn of the 20th century. Salvage ethnography is an explicit attempt to document the rituals, practices, and myths of cultures facing extinction from dislocation or modernization. So as you can see from this sort of specialist dictionary definition, this is a, a phenomenon that takes place at a particular time, you know, around the turn of the century and is associated generally with one person, Franz Boas and his students. Um, and you can see again, that what, it, what it really is, this is an attempt to document the rituals, practices and myths of cultures that are apparently facing extinction. Uh, from dislocation or modernization. So that's sort of the jumping off point. This is sort of the definition that I was working with before engaging in this research. And I wanna respond to that a little bit um, and challenge it 
I want to argue to you that, in fact, what we're talking about here is a cultural salvage movement, uh, something that goes beyond one person or even one person and their students. This was, in fact, a movement that involved many more people uh, than is commonly understood. It, in fact, begins much earlier, a full two generations, maybe, before Franz Boas was even born and is really intimately tied to colonialism. Um, it's also not just one person and their student, it's students, it's built up through an array of social connections, an array of social networks. And by that, I don't mean, of course, social networks and sort of the common parlance, but like in 19th century uh, uh, ideas of what networks might mean. This is not just some sort of passing fanciful fad or buzzword. This, in fact, as those photographs indicate uh, at the, uh, the opening of this presentation, this really intimately shapes popular knowledge for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who visit these museums during the course of the 20th century, and indeed deeply shapes those museums and the exhibitions, but also the collections that they have. And connected to that, this leaves behind for us today this really complex and in many ways problematic archive. All right, so now turning to another, in my view, really remarkable photograph. Um, sort of looks like my son's bedroom uh, in, in some ways, um, but you can see here almost, you know, not quite floor to ceiling, but piled high are these remarkable objects from across North America that are being brought together under the auspices of uh, the Bureau of American Ethnology and later uh, the Smithsonian Institution here in what is now, I believe, the Arts and Industries Building right on the National Mall. And sometimes when you read texts about the 19th century, history of science in the 19th century, people will talk about attempts to uh, create order, scientific order and, and natural history order and, and social sciences and, and creating order and, and um, sort of logical understanding in the face of a chaotic natural world. So I see that on some level, but I also see uh, a lot of chaos in this photograph. And I see a, a lot of sort of almost an indication of, of uh, some haphazard collecting and um, uh, people put to work. You can see here uh, exclusively white men, I believe in this image, uh, who are cataloging and documenting uh, this collection. Uh, in in uh, some meaningful way, but I want to give you this image as sort of an indication of the size and the scale of the project that we're talking about. That over the course of the 1870s, 1880s, and into the 1890s, this grows from being essentially an amateur project in which a very few people are interested in, to becoming this national project that dozens of people are working on engaging with at any given time, official staff members, volunteers, uh, individuals like Francis Densmore and, and many others. And ultimately what it results in are collections like the one photographed here. Um, remarkable collections of objects, but also collections of word lists and dictionaries, recordings of songs, stories, many, many other objects and materials from around the world. So I want to argue tonight that this story doesn't, in fact, begin with Franz Boas and his students. The story actually begins a great deal earlier with the uh, chance meeting of two people in a New York State bookstore. So picture here on the left, uh, sort of a unique, rare image of Lewis Henry Morgan, who was a uh, railroad attorney at this time, uh, so, sort of only middling uh, in terms of his success, um, but uh, also had a, an obsession, you might say, uh, in terms of his free time of dressing up like an Indian and uh, pretending to engage in Native American ceremonies with his friends. So he and his friends in, in upstate New York would uh, attempt to uh, learn about the Iroquois and the, the, the uh, Iroquois Confederacy of, of tribes, 
uh, uh, imitate their dress, their songs, their stories, and uh, in, in sort of the most clear and obvious example of cultural appropriation of all time, in some ways, uh, attempt to, to sort of take this on. There's this um, uh, incredible book by a scholar, Phil Deloria, uh, called Playing Indian, that goes in uh, to deep dive uh, of, of Lewis Henry Morgan, in part because following sort of this curious interest, he meets uh, a teenager named Eli S. Parker. So Eli Parker, pictured here uh, as an older man, is a, a Seneca Indian who is a, a remarkable person. It is, it, to me, absolutely baffling that there hasn't been a Netflix movie made about this person. Uh, Eli Parker, as a teenager, uh, uh, basically, you know, uh, like a, a, a vacuum, he sort of sucks up every text that he can um, uh, read. He's, he's known as this incredible, at his high school, he's known as this incredible speech maker. Uh, he, uh, uh, according to one biography, he's walking down the street one day and hears a ruckus at a saloon and uh, hears a bar fight going on and jumps into the middle of the bar fight. And he realizes that one of the participants in the bar fight is a friend of his that he actually knows and has met before. And he defends his friend in the midst of this bar fight. He helps break it up and defend his friend and, and they win the fight apparently. And according to uh, one biographer, this friend was uh, Ulysses S. Grant, <laughs> a man who was sort of down on his luck at that time, but then becomes a, a rising star in the Union Army. So uh, Eli Parker, as you can see on the very faintly on the bottom of this photograph, you can see Colonel Eli Parker. He becomes the highest ranking American Indian in the Union Army as a special aide to Ulysses S. Grant. Um, there are also a couple of just fascinating things about him. He, um, because he goes through sort of this traditional European school that's sponsored by his friend who's met him at a bookstore, uh, Lewis Henry Morgan, he has impeccable handwriting. Uh, Parker does. Handwriting that's so impeccable, in fact, that he's asked to be the first person uh, from the representative of the Union side to draft the surrender documents for the end of uh, the Civil War. Um, so after the Civil War, he leads an interesting life and, and um, gets married and, and becomes uh, briefly the director of the Bureau of uh, uh, Indian Affairs. Um, but his connection to Morgan is really consequential for the story of anthropology, the story of um, uh, salvage anthropology, in my view, in that Morgan uh, meets Parker and is connected to the Seneca world. He then begins to meet uh, uh, Parker's um, uh, uncles, sisters, grandparents, uh, all of his relatives, and learn about making houses. He learns about religious traditions. Uh, he learns about uh, material culture and beadwork from uh, 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 Parker's uh, woman relatives. Um, really this remarkable story. T to me, one of the things that's sort of lost in this is that uh, Morgan writes not only the first uh, American ethnography ever written, he also collects uh, 400 objects uh, uh, that are later burned in a fire. So uh, in some ways, he's, he's setting really these foundations for what comes later in terms of documenting, preserving, and hoping to protect material culture for future generations. And this idea that these things are threatened and uh, uh, will in fact vanish if uh, people like uh, Morgan and Parker don't step in to, to try to uh, address this situation. Okay, so Morgan, uh, not only his writing, uh, but also his personal friendship uh, becomes really deeply influential for the people who are founding the Bureau of American Ethnology. So now we're adding, we're taking this little project that people are, are working on and we're adding some rocket fuel to it in that um, uh, a huge amount of bureaucratic organization starts to uh, come into this uh, story, uh, some government dollars, but also, as you can see from this uh, remarkable document, not only is the Bureau of American Ethnology hiring ethnologists to go and collect, they're hiring photographers, clerks and copyists to try to organize all of these materials. 
um, as well as even a messenger, I love that, uh, a messenger here at the bottom uh, before email or, or text, right? You need someone to run around messages to Washington, D.C. Uh, to try to um, do your lobbying and, and so forth. So this becomes this robust organization. John Wesley Powell, who is famous in his own right, becomes uh, sort of a devotee of more, uh, uh, Lewis Henry Morgan. He reads his uh, books and they, they become friends. Um, Powell, his uh, uh, background is in geology. He becomes the first individual or white individual uh, that's sort of known in, in the historical record with a group to um, uh, successfully uh, explore the Colorado River and the Grand Canyon. Um, but you can see he uh, is also missing his um, one of his arms that he's lost in the Battle of Shiloh. He is a Civil War veteran. Um, and uh, uh, over the course of his time spent in the American West becomes increasingly obsessed with documenting and again, uh, trying to preserve something about Native American cultures. Morgan uh, convinces other individuals uh, like Powell and, and others are thinking about through this uh, same era that perhaps uh, cultures go through a sort of set of stages from savagery all the way up towards civilization, and they become more evolved and sophisticated uh, over time. And frankly, this is an idea that is taken for granted by many people in the 19th and, and early 20th century. And, and today we'll see that this is really an outmoded and uh, in so many respects problematic idea, but in this era, it was sort of taken for granted that um, each time you document a word or an object or a story, you're preserving something along this trajectory from uh, savagery to civilization. Here now is a remarkable photograph of someone who, as much as I wanted to get away from Franz Boas, he becomes sort of this magnet uh, that uh, is uh, connecting so many other elements of the story. So Boaz is an anthropologist who is a German American immigrant. He's Jewish and probably as a result of uh, anti Semitic bias is turned away for uh, a curatorship at the Field Museum, which he helps establish some of their early collections, uh, but ultimately lands on his feet and becomes a curator at the American Museum of Natural History in New York where he mentors many, many future curators and, and students and scholars, brings together this massive collection, not just of objects and songs and stories, but of things like this, where Boaz had gone out into the field and the, into the Pacific Northwest and had learned not only the traditional uh, uh, songs and stories, but also the poses that were used to uh, express some of these uh, 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 either songs or rituals or, or stories that were passed along. And here you can see him at a museum studio uh, documenting these particular poses. Uh, also in sort of these collections are uh, remarkable, um, you know, people count in different ways in different languages, you know, like the order in which we count or, or, or um, sort of subtle hand gestures are, are different in different cultures. And anthropologists became really interested in this in the late 19th and early 20th century. So Boaz, as much as I really wanted to get away from him as being singularly responsible for the story, he uh, attracts a lot of funding and gives funding to his students. He uh, uh, has high exacting standards. He, you know, I promise you the whole entire book isn't just about fistfights that people get into, but Boaz also is rumored to have gotten into a really remarkable fistfight. And he has a scar on the side of um, his face, uh, uh, which sort of matches in some ways with his personality. Um, people said that uh, that, that's, uh, that fight had originated because someone had uttered an anti-Semitic remark. Uh, and Boaz was certainly one to stand up for himself and had high exacting standards for, for people around him. So at one point, a whole exhibit was put up at the American Museum of Natural History. Boaz takes one look at it and writes to the curator and says, you will immediately take down this exhibit and redo it um, uh, uh, on our, our high exacting standards. But he issued funding to other colleagues and uh, sort of steered the course behind the scenes uh, 
of uh, much of the story in, in truly remarkable ways. But there were other people who were involved in this who I think get less recognition. Among them, James Mooney. James Mooney was uh, uh, an, uh, from an Irish American family and would have been the first in his family to go to college. Um, and uh, remarkably, you can see some of his high school and college transcripts uh, at the National Anthropological Archives and sort of learn something about his trajectory and his family. But to me, what was really amazing about uh, James Mooney is that at times and places over the course of his uh, research with Plains Indians, uh, he does research with, I think, something on the order of 30 different tribal communities. But amongst the Kiwa and amongst the Cheyenne in particular, he uh, embraces the, the method of creating models. And so that is realizing, for example, with lodge or teepee covers. So of course, these uh, teepees are the quintessential home sort of uh, unit of uh, so many Native American tribes in, in the Great Plains. And uh, uh, very often, these are objects that are created based on uh, visions or uh, 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 you know, sort of patterns or realizations that appear to people in dreams or, or things like vision quests, and they're proprietary. So by that, I mean that if you had a particular vision of certain colors or certain you know, uh, events in, in history, um, that that belonged to you and your family. That didn't belong to uh, someone else, and, and copying those designs would have been akin to plagiarism, right? So James Mooney realizes, though, that many of these uh, teepee or lodge coverings uh, with these incredible uh, bison hides are still being used, right? Like it's like asking to document someone's home by taking their home. It, uh, it, it in so many respects, right, is, is not uh, the, 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 a, a way to, to go about doing this um, work. So what James Mooney uh, uh, realizes is that you can use this uh, remarkable new resource called the Sears and Roebuck catalog. And you can order uh, buckskin uh, from the Sears and Roebuck catalog that has been uh, processed, I assume, in, sh in Chicago and uh, shipped to you these uh, really beautiful white buckskins. So certainly smaller in size than a, a bison skin, but something that then you could bring to tribal elders or historians within any given nation or community and invite them to add their documentation or, or add their um, uh, special designs to uh, these materials. So James Mooney is remarkable to me in that he creates uh, this model village and then displays it on uh, many different occasions, both at different world's fairs, but also at a uh, Kansas City hotel lobby where people could come and see this as in sort of a temporary exhibition of an entire village, an entire Kiwa village. Um, documented by uh, Mooney. And all of these materials, including this uh, remarkable uh, um, uh, lodge uh, cover that is uh, mimicked here in, in buckskin, is uh, uh, in the collection of the Smithsonian Institution at the National Museum of Natural History. And one can look at these materials uh, fully digitized now and scan in on any uh, component of that and, and really do a deep dive uh, into these materials in a remarkable way. Um, but to me, you know, one fascinating story that I think we'll get into a little bit here um, is the fact that uh, 99 out of every 100 of these objects that we're talking about are collected, researched, and then held behind the scenes. They're not necessarily displayed in uh, the museum the way these were temporarily at a Kansas City a uh, hotel or uh, at museums or fairs temporarily. I believe this was displayed at a World's Fair in Nashville for a while. Um, but then ultimately they're, they're placed behind the scenes and, and maybe brought out for special exhibitions. Uh, but now today they can be digitized uh, and potentially enjoyed around the world. Another aspect of the story that I became really interested in is art. So when I was reading about salvage anthropology or trying to sort of gather references to salvage anthropology, when I would read histories of art and the documentation of native art, 
so many people would reference artists like George Catlin, the painter, uh, the painter who, uh, the incredibly prolific painter who painted the image on the the my, uh, the left here, and uh, Edward Curtis, uh, the pho photographer who created these images, uh, uh, photo uh, photographic images on the right. So uh, a chapter in this book takes seriously this idea of looking at artists as salvage anthropologists. So uh, to what extent were painters and later photographers um, engaging in this as a discourse? Uh, to what extent were they responding to these as challenges? Um, and to what extent were they uh, engaging in this larger overall project to document, record, and preserve cultures which they perceived to be uh, as, as threatened uh, one scholar says about Edward Curtis, the photographer who took the, the photograph uh, on, on the right, um, the most important thing to know about Curtis is this. He took photographs in the 20th century to make them appear as though they were from the 19th. And these are not just, you know, some sort of fanciful, uh, 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 you know, uh, paintings that are, are, are shown and, and exhibited and then put away. These are things that people would have encountered on a regular basis to attend lectures like this. You could sort of imagine the equivalent of a Zoom lecture in uh, their day. Um, a hello to those people around the world. But um, if you were attending this type of a lecture in uh, uh, the turn of the century in, in Washington, D.C. at the Smithsonian, uh, you would have attended in a room like this that was, uh, in fact, surrounded by these paintings from the 19th century documenting uh, what were believed to be then distinct ethnic groups or Native American nations that we might better understand them now. And indeed, these types of events were really popular, right? Here's a, an example of a full house uh, of, of people uh, listening to uh, lectures about uh, the Arctic, I believe, just based on, on what's uh, up here in the front. But these sort of pictures or images, paintings would have been really ever present for uh, uh, people uh, working to, uh, uh, you know, or people even just attending these lectures casually for, for entertainment, uh, this sort of preservation documentation and um, emphasis on indigenous culture all would have been really ever present uh, for people attending these types of uh, lectures. I could have chosen many different places to do a case study of salvage anthropology from a particular geographic location. I could have talked about the Dakotas, where there was a huge amount of work like this going on, or Oklahoma, of course, where so many tribes were relocated uh, as a result of, of forced relocation and, and um, uh, 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 termination policies. Um, but uh, uh, California really jumped out to me as a potential uh, uh, location of where a lot of this uh, takes place. Uh, I was surprised to learn originally, so many people are surprised to know that California is one of the most linguistically diverse places on the planet. Um, that maybe only second to a couple of places in, uh, you know, in New Zealand islands, I believe, but there, there are just a few places around the world with indigenous languages as rich and diverse as California. Um, so, of course, this becomes this remarkable place for, for so many uh, people. Franz Boas sends a number of his best students to California, to the University of California there in uh, San Francisco, Berkeley, to really uh, try to document uh, the languages and, and materials of these uh, California Indians. And uh, this becomes sort of this laboratory, in a way, of uh, uh, salvage uh, anthropology. Um, one of the many individuals who becomes uh, caught up then in the story is uh, the man on the left here seen with um, a Native American chief in San Francisco. This is John P. Harrington. So Harrington was fascinating in that he was a linguist. Uh, he worked with the Smithsonian and the Bureau of American Ethnology, really building on this tradition established by Francis Densmore and others. Um, but, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to speculate too much on uh, sort of who Harrington was as a person, but there are these remarkable letters and contemporary accounts that say, you know, this was a pretty strange person. 
And he was so obsessed with documenting native languages that he would walk around uh, with a notebook or a strange typewriter with gravy stains on his shirt and not even notice or care, right? Like he was so uh, uh, committed to his work that um, sort of those things uh, uh, didn't quite matter to him. And certainly he rubbed some people, including Alfred Krober, one of Boaz's students, uh, the wrong way. Um, you know, let me get back to that in a second. But um, a couple of things uh, ultimately are remarkable about John P. Harrington, who goes up and down Northern California and becomes almost to an obsessive degree, uh, decides to chase after whomever can be described as the last living person speaking any given language. And what's remarkable to me is that, uh, uh, you know, sometimes perhaps this, this word is overused, but perhaps we can describe Harrington as a savant. Um, native Californians who have reviewed uh, Harrington's material have told me that um, in instances where John P. Harrington was able to spend more than two weeks with any given community in California, he had about a 90 to 95 percent accuracy rate of learning and being able to repeat and document languages. So um, he was really remarkable. Now, in terms of organization, John P. Harrington was a little lacking. When he died, over one million pages of documents, some of them original, never able to be reproduced uh, documents where he found that last living speaker of X, Y, or Z given language, were found interspersed with, uh, in um, uh, uh, sheds and houses in Maryland, Washington, D.C., uh, and throughout California. Uh, a project that um, uh, scholars at, at UC Davis, as well as at the Smithsonian Institution, have been sort of piecing together uh, ever since John P. Harrington's uh, death. Um, okay, so again, I just I want to underscore that there's there's an element of the story that we know, right? That when we visit the Smithsonian or when we visit the American Museum of Natural History, that we see uh, uh, some uh, aspect of that, but that you know, 90 to 99 percent of the material that was collected by uh, these individuals, missionaries, uh, scholars, curators, volunteers, army officers, um, people who, who sort of learned about or understood on some level this idea, uh, this misleading idea and in many, so many respects wrong-headed idea and racist assumption that native people were uh, on the road to uh, uh, extinction and the appropriate response to this would be to document and preserve these materials amongst other archaeological and uh, natural history objects from around the world uh, results in this right results in uh, the Smithsonian Institution and, and other institutions uh, like it having these incredibly massive and, and large collections that are in some ways used and utilized by researchers, but in other ways, um, perhaps uh, lesser known than they, than they should be, right? The, for example, of the uh, James Mooney miniatures, for example, or replicas um, as, as being a, a one of many, many examples. Uh, another sort of question that comes up in this book are what are we to do about these lesser known collections within national museums, right? So it's not that the Smithsonian isn't known, but that some of these collections aren't known. So in order to better wrestle with this this, these questions, I, I, I decided to engage in a number of conversations. And some of them were informal and, and not recorded, and, and people gave me ideas and, and thoughts on background. But uh, uh, some generous individuals were willing to uh, speak to me as well, sort of on the record, as it were. Here's this really remarkable quote that was offered to me by a, 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 a incredible curator named Joe Horsecapture at the Autry Museum in LA, who shared with me, you know, there are many examples of native researchers combing this information and bringing it back to the community. This includes details about ceremonies that are no longer practiced and language resources. If they didn't exist in museums and archives, how would they be brought back to the community? It's a love-hate relationship. 
So, you know, that was something that was really on my mind as I was working through these uh, uh, files and, and thinking about what this meant as a, a phenomenon. I want to just uh, add a couple of, of final stories here by way of conclusion. So one of the problems here is that uh, this was all about long term preservation long term preservation sort of took precedence at all cost. Uh, in this story, so here you can see on the left here an original hat uh, well over a century old a wooden hat uh, and uh, objects uh, that were uh, quote unquote to use the parlance of the time poisoned. So this means objects that are made out of organic material which come on that can be anything feather wood bone so many things are made out of organic material, of course. You don't want bugs or other pests to eat these organic materials. So their solution to this in the 19th century was to douse these materials in chemicals like mercury or arsenic. Chemicals that we, of course, know today are dangerous to handle, uh, even uh, potentially causing uh, uh, cancer, contributing to, to cancer later on. So things that you don't want to necessarily uh, touch or, or handle. And in light of the current conversation about repatriation and return of some of these materials that were taken in an unethical way, what do we do with that? What do we do with materials that are preserved, uh, that are, uh, you know, were quote unquote preserved uh, in ways that included um, carcinogenic or other hazardous chemicals? So, one fascinating example of a possible solution came up in researching the story, and that is the example of a 3D printed hat. So this is uh, Ray Wilson, who is a Clinkett clan leader here pictured on the right, uh, wearing for the first time a replica hat that was made, made as a near copy of the original hat that was uh, in the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, the, the, the tribe, I understand, had requested, or the First Nations community in this case, had requested uh, a, a near uh, copy, not an exact copy. Um, but uh, Ray Wilson shared, our grandchildren will be using this hat down the line. We did ask the old hat if it would treat the new hat like it was its child. I just find this to be a really remarkable story where uh, the old hat was put into a room overnight with this new 3D printed hat. And uh, the community asked the old hat if it wouldn't mind passing on its stories to the new 3D printed hat that then could be used in um, new ceremonies and uh, in, in the community. So one last example of this, um, of course, there were so many native uh, 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 diplomats, uh, dignitaries uh, and uh, individuals who visited Washington DC uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. Of course, they often wore traditional formal regalia and uh, new photograph studios who were keen to document interesting uh, uh, things, goings on about town, individuals that then they could then sell these images. Uh, this was quite common. And many of these photographs were then subsequently added to the collection of the Bureau of American Ethnology and the Smithsonian Institution, again, by way of this permanent preservation project. So I felt really fortunate to speak to this incredible artist named Wendy Redstar. One of, uh, she's a multimedia artist. She engages in lots of different media. And one of her provocative series is to print out large digital reproductions of these 19th century images and that are very often mislabeled, right? Saying this is a crow man. And she will, in fact, you know, include the names of the original individuals and, and uh, explanatory notes about what these, um, uh, what these uh, uh, items of clothing uh, and, and um, uh, things actually mean uh, for this individual. Uh, so I was really keen then to talk to, to, to Wendy Redstar and, and ask her what she thought about the history and legacy of salvage anthropology. And you know, one of the, the ways that I was thinking about this was this exploitative rendering, right, where this, it's extractive, it involves a lot of exploitation of these white scientists 
who are going and, and, and uh, taking, and in some cases, outright stealing materials from Native people. But she, she pushed back in some meaningful way and said, I really do feel like we need to give our ancestors more agency. I think they knew what they were doing. And maybe sometimes we, uh, they were doing things for subversive reasons to maintain the culture. I realize too that this is part of our story, this colonialism and this way of collecting objects. That's part of the object story now too. You can't deny that and you shouldn't. So I'd like to thank you uh, for being here and thinking about salvage anthropology over the course of the last uh, few minutes. And I look forward to uh, questions or observations that, that people may have. Thank you. Yes, please. The Yanomamo technology is one that needs to mind is sort of a band born in sort of mid 20th century. Do you think that we're doing any better at that point or was it about the same? Excellent question. So I think some things had changed and maybe some things had stayed similar in terms of the trajectory there. Um, but one thing that changes, a market change, even in that course of that 20 years, between like the 30s up to the 50s, is that there's much less of a collecting emphasis. And a lot of individuals, even, for example, Franz Boas, leaves, uh, leaves uh, um, the American Museum of Natural History and starts working at Columbia University. So a lot of the, the next generation of uh, anthropologists are working at universities rather than museums. And the collecting emphasis in some ways dissipates. So I'm thinking of, for example, like Laura Nader creates this, the, several famous PBS national documentaries, uh, who is an anthropologist who's working at, at ethnography, but she's not necessarily interested in museums and museum studies and, and collecting in that way. So I think there's, there is a noticeable uh, change in the trajectory by that time uh, and a less of an emphasis on collecting and museums and m perhaps more of a visual emphasis and, and uh, dissemination. Last thing that I'll mention on that is that before really the 1930s, I mean, there were some talky films, right, in the late 1920s, but those were Hollywood produced and took money and stuff like that, lining up the spoken word with a visual image is something that the vast, vast majority of scholars like can't afford to do or it's not technologically possible. So part of the story here is a story of technological change as well as a change in intellectual history and change in ideas. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. It was very interesting. Thank you. I was wondering if you could have an opinion, if you had an opinion on whether this tied into um, other things that were going on at the same time. Mm -hmm. For example, over at the Peter Museum at Harvard, they have all sorts of studies, let's say, of immigrant populations and cartography. And W.E.B. E. Du Bois did a lot of studies of African-American populations. Uh, I, I'm familiar with some things he did in Philadelphia, for example, and so on. So. I'm just wondering if, if, if you think this fits into a broader movement that sort of try to record and, and compartmentalize uh, different populations. Yes, totally. Thank you for, for bringing that up. Um, uh, and, and thank you for uh, mentioning Du Bois, who, you know, is this pioneering sociologist who, and, and so many, so many other things um, in, in terms of um, uh, taking on different different questions related to immigration and, and sort of change over time. Um, Franz Boas and some of his rivals are debating this uh, on some level. And there are so many, uh, you know, I look at this a little bit in my first book and, and then as well here, um, but some of the questions are about physiology, right? Uh, for as sort of strange as the sounds to us today, um, even in the early 20th century, questions were uh, sort of in the ether. Um, if people come and spend two or three generations in North America, will they start to look more like Native Americans than Europeans? You know, what is sort of the difference between the environmental influence and what we might now call like uh, ancestry? Um, 
And uh, there's a lot of, of course, political motivation behind that that's connected to larger global questions in the 30s and 40s, right? One cannot help but think about when, um, uh, you know, another scholar, a, a, a bone collector, uh, the head of the physical anthropology program, Alice Erdlichka, is debating with Franz Boas about sort of the present situation of immigration. In the background, right, is the fact that Franz Boas is a Jewish man and is well aware of what's happening in, in places like uh, Germany and elsewhere um, in terms of uh, prosecute, you know, uh, the, the, the up, you know, the growing uh, uh, tide of, of the Holocaust. Um, so certainly those sorts of things are, are drum beats that are that are happening in, in the background. Absolutely. Um, and um, as far as like the general, the exact connection with Du Bois, as someone at UMass with uh, his papers being there, I would, was always looking out for references to his name and I would have liked to have seen more connection, but um, uh, I don't know that he was exactly concerned with uh, 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 collecting material culture in such a way. I would love to be corrected uh, in, in that, but um, uh, he, he was sort of documenting at the same time other, other interests, but it would be interesting to see if they, they cross paths at any, at any given time and certainly might have. So Megan asks, in your research, did you find that the anthropologists collecting material cultural, material cultural, it, court, well, sorry, sorry, I'm trying to read. Sure, yeah. <laughs> uh, material culture in order to save it from the so-called dying cult cultures were also working to protect the native peoples or were involved in native rights or were they only focused on the objects and stories and languages? What an excellent question. Was that from Megan? Yes. <laughs> Quick shout out to Megan. Thank you for that uh, uh, question. Um, so honestly, I, I wanna give a, a more of a cynical response to that than um, uh, I might uh, like, but part of, to me, the problem with salvage anthropology is that people become obsessed with the objects and the stories rather than the people that are producing them. And so uh, many people, um, for example, the perhaps the best uh, example of this is uh, Alice Cunningham Fletcher, who is uh, essentially a contemporary of Francis Densmore um, and a remarkable individual who's collecting material uh, in the Great Plains spending an extraordinary amount of time out there, but tells this remarkable story of becoming obsessed with native music um, because she becomes, she falls ill and many of her native friends come to sing to her. And she has a background in music and starts to connect and, and start to understand native music uh, and really gets interested in documenting and preserving native music. Um, and I think on some level has a, a, a genuine and, and maybe, you know, we could say sincere love and care for her friends who are, are native people but is counter to that in a contradictory sort of way a major supporter of the dawes act um this effort to break up native uh collectively owned land into uh farms uh that are sort of understood by european uh, uh market economies but of course a story probably well known to many of the listeners here and, and people in the audience tonight that the, the land that was given to so many of these people was not necessarily or understatement uh land that was not uh, uh able to be cultivated in a successful way and and this was just a project that was doomed to fail on so many respects so there's there's a real contradiction here in that we see in these letters um and the original materials so much deep care for many of these people and yet simultaneously some pretty wrong-headed ideas about how to incorporate them into quote-unquote modern life okay well, I really liked the example of the hat that you showed, and I was curious if um, thinking about like reparation and restitution, sure. um, if that was kind of a one off example of that kind of restitution, or if more institutions are thinking about this and how laws and NAGPRA and other things are forcing people or, you know, whether that's really something that people are undertaking. Excellent. Yeah. So there's this 1990, 1989, 1990 law or set of laws that um, uh, NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, as well as the National Museum of the American Indian Act, 
that compelled the Smithsonian and then other institutions that got any federal funding to inventory their collections and potentially return them. Uh, uh, but only 30% of eligible human remains have been returned to tribes uh, here now, uh, more than 30 years later. So um, part of me wonders about these creative solutions and these alternative solutions in, in some ways that we're talking about sort of the letter of the law, but what about things that maybe fall under the spirit of the law? What about things that aren't necessarily religiously sacred objects that could potentially be uh, 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 you know, uh, repatriated or returned or replicated in ways that um, could potentially be important or meaningful to these uh, communities. So in the conclusion sec concluding section of this book, I take those questions on and, and look at some uh, examples of that. But my, from my perspective, there's a lot more that can and should be done. Great. Well, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation, and we have books for sale in the lobby, and I would encourage the people joining us online uh, to consider buying a book through their favorite online retailer. Thank you. Thank you.